Hello, good morning. My name is Captain Shanika Chu Ying. I retired after 20 years of service in the United States Army. Retirement was not a choice I wanted at that time. I enlisted into the Army at the age of 17 with an attitude to be all that I can be. I always thought that, that I would make general before I retired, but that didn't happen. Unfortunately, my service came to an end because of renal failure due to lupus. In my 20th year of service, I was medically retired. I was alive because of dialysis, but a life of dialysis came with a lot of restrictions, such as what I can eat, where I can travel. My energy was limited. I was thirsty all day, every day, and I was labeled disabled and I could no longer work. This kind of living went on for about two years, and then someone at Walter Reed called me and told me they have a match. And that match was a Marine that said, I want to donate my kidney to you. And the lady said to me, when can you be here by Monday? I forgot what day it was, but she said, can you be here by Monday? And I said, I could be there today if you want me to. That's how I felt. It was a no-brainer. Um, I came down to Walter Reed. I'm from Brooklyn. Came down to Walter Reed, and I met my transplant team. I like to say their names because I've grown to know them. They know me. They're a part of me now. Um, Dr. Hawksworth, Dr. Ottman, Vilda, Captain Case, Dr. Patel, Dr. Bowen, and Dr. Curry. And I also met the Marine that gave me his kidney. His name is Kevin. I get chills when I think about what he did to me and how he changed my life. This transplant happened on February 12th, four months ago. Thank you. So I stand here today speaking to all of you at the White House. Yes, I have to take anti-rejection medications, but I can do that because now I have the will and I have the strength and I have the will to go and get whatever I want and I can be a productive member of society. Organ transplant changes the course of lives for the better and I hope more people get to have the opportunity to have a life-changing, a life-saving transplant. Thank you. <laughs> Um, oh, and now I'd like to introduce Jeff Zanks. I don't know where you went. Oh, over there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Come on up. Well, thank you, Captain. Yeah, um, chills is the right way to describe it. Thank you. Um, I want to welcome everybody, and uh, before I start, I want to repeat what the President said uh, yesterday on the tragedy uh, in Orlando. This is a sobering reminder that attacks on any American, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, or sexual orientation, is an attack on all of us, and on the fundamental values of equality and dignity that define us as a country. And no act of hate or terror will ever change who we are or the values that make us Americans. Today, um, in sharp contrast to Orlando and the tragedy there, is also about American values and hope and opportunity. Um, today's summit is about impacting the lives of millions of Americans improving patient outcomes, and reducing health care costs. This issue is personal for me, uh, a very great friend, Mike Berman, who's here in the second row, who used to be in this building when Vice President Mondale was here as Mondale's most trusted advisor. He's been a trusted advisor to me throughout my career. I think it's fair to say that I would not have made the transition from private sector to public service, but for Mike's counsel and advice. Mike needed a kidney transplant to survive, and fortunately, Mike is here. This is one of the very positive stories. He was lucky to get a kidney from his sister, and he's here today. So Mike, thank you.
All of you know Mike's not alone, um, and the captain's not alone. In fact, more than 120,000 people on, are on an organ waiting list in the U.S. alone. So every 10 minutes, that list actually grows. Someone is added to the list, and the gap between available organs and the need continues to widen. At the same time, 22 people each day in the U.S. die waiting for an organ transplant. Those fortunate individuals wait months or years for the possibility of an organ transplant, and that clearly impacts people's lives and places enormous stress on families and other support networks. It also has sub substantial implications for our country's health care costs and patient outcomes. Take kidneys. Kidneys are about 80 percent of the, of the need or the demand on the waiting list. End-stage kidney failure costs Medicare, just Medicare, more than $34 billion a year. That's more than 7 percent of the total Medicare budget. So one out of every $12, $13, $14 is spent on end-stage kidney failure. In fact, that $34 billion, just to put it in context, is more than the entire budget of NIH. For each patient receiving a kidney transplant, the government would save $60,000 a year. That totals up to billions of dollars annually. Even more important than the billions of dollars is life expectancy of a living donor kidney recipient increases by 10 to 15 years. That's the difference between seeing your daughter or son graduate from college or getting to know your grandkids. What's so exciting is that we can solve this problem. 95 percent of Americans support donation upon death, but only half of Americans register. So 95 percent support, only half register. A recent poll said that 25 percent, or one out of every four Americans, are willing to donate a kidney while alive to a total stranger. Solving these types of problems is what we do so well in this country. This is, this is a huge source of what makes America such a great economy. We are number one in the world in innovation. We have 15 of the top 25 research institutes in the world, about a third of research and development happens here in the U.S. About a third of global patents come from the U.S. And then we have this intangible, this unrivaled culture of entrepreneurship. We see it every day, leading to breakthroughs in areas now like artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, and in so many areas of health care, cancer treatment, immunotherapies, the list goes on and on. And that's why we're so thrilled to have all of you here today. We have leaders in advanced data, in clinical science, in emerging technologies, and social media. This is the right group of leaders to help more people register to donate their organs, to accelerate, bring forward the time frame for the next breakthrough, and expand the options for those in need of an organ transplant. This is a very important initiative for the President and the Administration. In fact, today we're able to announce the government, federal government led by the Department of Defense is investing $200 million to support next generation technologies that can be used to repair and replace cells and tissues that can dramatically increase the time organs can be stored and that will maximize the quantity and quality of organs that each donor is able to give. Let me close uh, with the President's words. We must all do our part to lift up donors, donor families, and patients by supporting efforts to shorten the organ waiting list. Together we can improve and save lives by celebrating those who give of themselves, whether as living donors or registered donors to provide the greatest gift there is to offer. 
Uh, before I stepped into this building seven years ago, I'd never been in uh, public service, as I mentioned um, in my intro or my words about Mike. I know how hard it is to get away from what you're doing every day. Uh, and so it's a really, really big deal that all of you decided to take time out and be here. I think we're all going to look back and say this, we are all present at the creation of something really special that's going to make a big difference in millions of people's lives. So I want to thank you for finding the time to be here. It's a really big deal. Thank you. I mean, uh, Patrick Conway from uh, CMS. Patrick. Thank you, uh, Jeff, and thank you all for being here today. I'm Patrick Conway. I'm uh, Chief Medical Officer at uh, CMS, Medicare and Medicaid, and the uh, Principal Deputy Administrator. Um, you know, I, I want to uh, really thank you for your commitment to organ donation and transplantation. Uh, I, looking around the room, I know, uh, many of you know personally how big an impact uh, it has on people. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and its agencies uh, who I'm representing today are deeply committed to increasing life-saving and life-enhancing uh, organ donation and transplantation. Uh, increased transplantation, as you know, has a tremendous impact on the patients who receive this extraordinary gift of life. Uh, for example, patients with end-stage renal disease go, on, go from costly, challenging uh, environments to a life-saving, reg uh, uh, a costly regimen of routine dialysis to recapturing a full quality of life uh, after transplant. Um, additionally, from a CMS perspective, increased uh, kidney donation also does represent a tremendous cost saving. It is $34 billion plus a year in Medicare uh, spend, but more importantly, as Jeff said, the impact on people in terms of quality of life and longevity uh, is huge. Um, we do think increased organ donation and transplantation is a powerful way to achieve the Secretary's goals of better health, better care, and smarter spending uh, in the delivery system reform arena. Uh, I'm still a practicing physician, uh, so I know I, I have taken care of children. I happen to be a pediatrician uh, with end-stage renal disease on dialysis, and I've taken care of children post-transplant, uh, and I've seen the impact it has on them and their families. Uh, I also, unfortunately, have seen children that were waiting for transplant and did not receive a transplant um, and had the effects from that. So, you know, this is a critical issue for our nation's uh, health. HHS and CMS, and uh, I see we've got um, leadership, uh, the acting administrator from the Health Resources and Service Administration here today and from throughout the department, know there's a number of opportunities to increase donation and transplantation, so I'll just call out a few. Uh, we are currently uh, exploring these opportunities uh, now. Um, variation in performance is one of the key uh, issues that we need to address to generate improvement. I'll call out two examples. The nation currently discards nearly 3,000 kidneys every year, 19 percent of the kidneys recovered from transplant. However, even while the national rate is increasing slightly, there are 17 out of 58 donation service areas where the discard rate is as low as 7 7 to 15 percent. How can we learn from those high-performing systems, spread that learning, and increase the transplant rate across the board? Two, uh, similarly, there are parts of the nation where system systematic work to identify and transplant kidneys from donation after circulatory death donors is having a substantial impact. Nationally, while 15 percent of all deceased donors are donation after circulatory death, there are five out of 58 donation service areas where it's 30 to 35 percent. Uh, of the donations um, from this type of donation. Raising the performance of all donor hospitals, organ procurement organizations, and transplant centers to the level of the highest performers is one of the many ways that together we can truly help thousands more people receive the benefit of a transplant. Systematic quality improvement work at national scale, we've seen what we can do. When we set clear aims, when we work together, we can improve uh, at a national level. Um, we are also actively working with HRSA and others, uh, UNOS, transplant surgeons, to identify are there regulations or other aspects that need to be uh, improved. We actually have Thomas Hamilton in the room, and if I, I'm going to call out people's name. You can raise your hand if I call you out. He 
taught me more about this than, he's probably forgotten more than I know, uh, and he recently retired from federal service after a distinguished career, uh, but he started the process already and had done much work in this arena as well and will continue to improve, I promise, Thomas. Enjoy your retirement. Um, you know, we uh, also have a couple additional areas I'd like to call out. One. Um, in the payment arena, and actually Alifia, uh, who used to work at uh, CMMI, started this work, um, and it's continued on, but our end-stage renal seamless care organizations, or ESCOs, essentially accountable care organizations, we've got leadership in the audience, uh, leading work to coordinate care for people with end-stage renal disease, and really focus on also how we increase the number of transplants. So. The dialysis clinic incorporated, and Doug Johnson is in the office, in the in here is here, is working with transplant centers and organ procurement organizations to maximize the proportion of organs from deceased donors that are transplanted. The Rogerson Institute is focused on the involvement of living donors. CMS is committing to ensure that these payment models support uh, transplant uh, for increasing numbers of beneficiaries. Two, I want to call out our end-stage renal disease quality improvement network work. We've got Dennis Wagner and Paul McGann uh, and others uh, here today, but are focused on things like reducing hospital-acquired infections, promoting the best vac vascular access for patients, promoting, treatment modal promoting the treatment modality of home dialysis, and would love uh, discussion today about innovation and new modalities like home dialysis and other uh, innovative areas, increasing transplant referrals and improving quality of life for dialysis patients. You know, to call out a few examples from the networks, they've developed transplant resource toolkits with materials targeted both for patient and provider education. They've assisted dialysis facilities with establi establishing dedicated education stations in the units to facilitate patient education. Um, we've, uh, for example, trained peer mentors to provide information while patients are in facilities on transplant. To call out a few uh, of the results, Network 4 achieved a 12 percent increase in baseline. Network 5, 31 percent increase. Network 6, 25 percent increase. We're also reducing racial disparities. So Network 5 had a 16 percent reduction uh, in racial disparities in transplant. So collaborative quality improvement, uh, driving improvement. Um, as I mentioned, we also think innovation in this area is critically important. So dialysis care, you know, years from now looks very different than dialysis care today, and the modalities for transplant and increasing transplant rates continue to improve. A few other folks I just wanted to recognize, Maggie Carey is here today, if you don't mind raising your hand. Um, you know, outgoing, uh, uh, outspoken, wonderful uh, person who has helped uh, in Michigan in our end-stage renal disease network is the leading patient voice. So this is bringing patients to the table to drive improvement in work, which is critical as we move forward. Um, you know, her, her family has a genetic, and I was told I can say this, so uh, has a genetic predisposition of polycystic uh, kidney disease. Her mother was on dialysis treatment. Her approximately 40-year-old son just began dialysis. So a personal mission for her and we need to support her and families like her in this improvement effort. So thank you for being here today, and thank you for all the work that you've done. Dr. Sanjeev Arora, I believe, is in the audience from Project ECHO, uh, Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes, which is an amazing methodology for using video conferencing and organized learning events at national and global scale to provide specialty care to patients who otherwise might not get it. Distinguished professor at the University of New Mexico, Don Berwick, who was uh, the first person who hired me, I've been through several administrators now, um, uh, I've been here a while, uh, called his work breathtaking and potentially one of the most single significant breakthroughs in quality improvement to occur in the last several dec decades. Kevin O'Connor, President and CEO of Life Center Northwest, uh, is a high-performing organ procurement organization that is Washington, Idaho, Alaska, and other ser service areas. Dr. Rick Perez, a professor of medicine and leading kidney transplant surgeon. So we've got so many people here today. I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you all for being here. This is a critical issue for our nation's health. It certainly has major cost implications, but most importantly, the implications for patients and families is huge. So thank you for being here today. Thank you for your work, and really appreciate it. Thanks. I'm Jennifer Erickson from the White House Office of Science Technology Policy. 
Next, you're going to hear from five powerful advocates about what's at stake and how we can help rise to the challenge of ending the organ waiting list. First up, we're going to hear from Dr. Kenneth Moritsugu, the former Surgeon General of the United States. This is considered a real lightning round, so hang in. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Call me Ken. 25 years ago, my wife, Donna Lee, died in an auto crash. Because we had discussed this issue before, the decision to donate her organs and tissues for transplantation was simple. I only had to carry out her wishes. And because of her decision, a man in Florida got her heart, a teenage boy in Washington, D.C., failing in school because of his disease, received a kidney and a pancreas. A hospital custodian obtained her other kidney. A woman in Pennsylvania received her liver. One cornea went to a young woman in Baltimore and the other to a government worker. Four years later, my teenage daughter, Vicki Leanne, was struck by a car and died. While we had had a positive experience donating my wife's organs four years before, frankly, we were conflicted because we didn't know what Vicki would have wanted. We ultimately decided to donate her organs and tissues. Shortly after we made that decision, my older daughter, Erica, said that she and her sister had had a conversation after my wife died, and Vicki stated that she too wanted to be an organ and tissue donor. Unlike today, where we have social media literally everywhere, we were not aware of that discussion during our decision-making process. And we could have decided not to donate, ignorant of that conversation. Knowing her intention would have made the decision so much easier. Through her gift, others again benefited. Her heart provided new life to a widow with several children in Pennsylvania. Her kidney went to a single father of three. Her other kidney helped a mother. Her liver sustained a man in Washington, D.C. Her corneas gave new sight to two people. 25 years ago, when Donna died, there were 29,000 people on the waiting list. Four years later, when Vicki died, that number had grown to 49,000. And today, there are over 120,000 people on that list. But can any of us even begin to imagine what the 120,000 people on the waiting list represents? Let me give you a visual. You know, there is only one pro football stadium which holds more than 91,000 spectators. That's right here in Washington, D.C., FedEx Field. So when you watch a pro football game in D.C., imagine that everyone in that stadium is on that waiting list, with another 30,000 people standing outside the stadium waiting to get in. But each number is more than a data point, because this is a human issue. Each number is a person like you, like me. We need to remember to keep the patient at the center of everything that we do. But who are the patients? They are the patients lying in the hospital beds, the patients waiting for a transplant. They are the patients lying in other hospital beds, the potential donors. But they are also the patients around the bedside, loved ones of the potential donors who in their grief will be facing the life or death decision regarding donation. Loved ones of the transplant recipients who provide care through the process. How can we help all these patients to declare their decision when they are still alive? To be aware of the intent of their loved ones, to support their loved ones through the process of transplantation. We can accomplish so much more by working better together than by working separately. We have made leaps in science and information technology with the ability to recover and use what formerly would be considered 
marginal organs. And we have the opportunity to keep collaborating, sharing protocols and data to go even farther. We have new approaches in advocacy and awareness so we can make it even easier to register wishes, including through social media, to share that information. We have trained professionals and sophisticated computers that can help us achieve domino kidney transplants. A single chain can facilitate many, many transplants. And so we work together to make sure that chains are helping some of our hardest to match patients. We can create new relationships and enhance existing ones between organ procurement organizations and transplant programs. So let's identify and overcome any barriers to increasing organ donation and transplantation. In this environment, we need to balance our heads, the science and the technology, with our hearts, the advocacy, and the caring. The two should be complementary, and we need to consider both as helping to increase organ donation and to save more lives through organ transplantation. These are the facts. These are the figures. And these are the faces of donation and transplantation. We must work together to solve this human problem. Hello, everybody. I am Jenna Arnold. Organize was founded two and a half years ago after my co-founder, Greg, sat by his father's bedside while he waited for a heart. Greg and I joined forces to see if there was something we could do to bring our backgrounds in technology and movement building to the organ donation community. We traveled the country taking <laughs> meetings with anybody who would give us 15 minutes. And what we heard time and again that we need more people to care about organ donation and we need to make it easier for them to record their donor wishes. We set out to build a central registry, which we've named 53, to make it easier for Americans to register. We recently had a 94-year-old register in 54 seconds. I challenge any 44-year-old to break that. I know Greg couldn't. <laughs> but in the middle of our quest to get everyone to register, we had a bit of an epiphany. We were in Utah testing our initial registration product when we met a woman whose 16-year-old son came home from school and said, hey, mom, I want to be an organ donor if something ever happens to me. Very much out of the blue, as most 16-year-olds don't necessarily bring this topic up after school, she made note of that. And unfortunately, you all know where this story is going. Two weeks later, on his way to school, he was killed. When the coordinator discussed donation with her. She humbly says, had she not had a conversation with her son two weeks earlier, she would have passed. She ultimately gave her blessing, and the woman who received her liver is now who she spends Christmas and Thanksgiving and Easter with. It was in his donation that she found a new life. After that story, we began questioning how we could record the wishes of the 150 million Americans who support organ don donation but lack formal registrations. So we went back to the original Uniform Anatomical Gift Act of 1968 to see what we could find. We found the following statement, which reads, any statement or symbol indicating a donor's wish should be considered a time of death. To better understand the copy, we knocked on the doors, very literally, of the two original authors of the law, Blair and Fred Sadler. At the time, that included things like signing a donor card or leaving a recorded message on an answering machine. We then challenged the Sadlers to come up with a modern day version of an answering machine message. They had the greatest insight and suggested that possibly a post on Facebook or a tweet or a post on Instagram could qualify, we said. Brilliant, thanks, and I'm sorry for interrupting your retirement. <laughs> Here's how it works. Anyone can publicly post their wishes on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and if they use hashtag organ donor or hashtag organ donation, we will capture it. 
Now, when a coordinator is working with next of kin to understand what the donor wanted, they can find these statements in addition to traditional registrations. What better way to hear that your deceased loved ones want to be an organ donor than in their own words? We are the founding mothers and fathers of an organized, pun intended, approach to this new process. Change always brings growing pains, but we're not going to get past the ceiling the industry has already hit if we're not willing to experiment. And that is too important not to try. If we don't, we're being complicit, and complacency is the cancer of humanity. When an idea's time has come, you can't get in the way of the moment. It transforms itself into a movement that we all in this room have in the palm of our hands. The seeds of a movement that will not just honor the wishes of those who have left us, but the pleas of those whose family members won't survive this Monday because they don't have access to a heart or a liver or a kidney. We believe we need two things, great ideas which we're all hearing today, but also a willingness to try them. Today, Organize is using this moment to formally invite all 58 organ procurement organizations in the United States to access our registry, 53, which securely houses both legal registrations and social media declarations. In parallel with our research, initiatives with the Laura and John Arnold Foundation and, ex and our expanding technology portfolio with partners like Johns Hopkins, Cleveland Clinic, and the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, we will spend the remainder of Organize's days working to distribute the message about the importance of organ donation. Our partners at Facebook, Twitter, and Do Something are helping us launch a campaign to capture one million donor wishes by the end of 2016. We look forward to hearing from those who are open to including us at the table of change, those who have paved the way in the industry from whom we have so much to learn, so we can all band together to end this wait list. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Good job. Hi there. My name is Simon Keith. Uh, I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Nevada Donor Network, one of those 58 OPOs that Jenna just invited to the party. Um, I'm also a heart recipient and celebrating 30 years in uh, this year. Thank you. In 2011, about five years ago, I went on a pilgrimage to seek out the family of the young 17-year-old boy who had tragically lost his life, and through his and his family's gift, my life was saved. I spent a day with my donor's father, culminating with a visit to my donor's final resting spot. A flood of emotions churned through me throughout that day, but as I stood at his gravesite, a strange calm overcame me. My donor, John, died in 1986. And at just 21 years old, I became the ultimate beneficiary of an amazing decision made by a courageous family in the wake of a true tragedy. That gift, the ultimate gift one human being can give to another, has provided me, my family, my kids, a rich and full life. How do you say thank you to someone who gave you everything? Literally everything. On that day, I can assure you there were no words. In the 30 years since receiving that fateful gift back in 86, I have learned a great deal about organ donation and transplantation. Clearly, America has a crisis. The crisis does not discriminate, and we are not exempt in my adopted home state of Nevada. I first understood the scope of this crisis as I found myself sitting on the board of directors for the organ procurement organization in Nevada called the Nevada Donor Network. As a successful, hard-charging businessman, I found the model for OPOs curious. The Nevada Donor Network uh, viewed itself much like a public service type utility business. It was ultra conservative, hesitant to embrace innovation, and quite frankly, stale. Our clinical results ranked us near or at the bottom of all OPOs in the United States in terms of the meaningful metrics. The Nevada Donor Network was an average OPO at best. So we made changes big sweeping changes. With the entry of a new CEO, myself moving into, this, into an internal role as a COO, 
we started challenging the tried and true methods of the organization. We ticked a lot of boxes. We made a lot of tough decisions. We implemented a lot of new processes and methodologies. We changed just about everything. But if there is a key driver in the formula for increased success, it is this. To view the organ donation system through a different lens. To look at a traditionally clinically driven system through the eyes of an entrepreneur. That is where the real collision occurred. That is where the magic happened. A good example of this is how we communicate. As you have just heard from Jenna, the idea of social declarations is new-ish, different, somewhat controversial, and potentially game-changing. In Nevada, we loved it. We immediately embraced it. We spent all of 2014 working through the idea and the concepts. We spent all of 2015 uh, running a pilot project where we aggregated data, we mapped the process, and we further refined the system. Once we really looked at the data and the impact that social declarations could potentially have on our numbers, we felt we could see an increase of potentially 10 to 20 percent. These are real numbers, real people, and real lives being saved. The impact could be huge. The Nevada Donor Network didn't invent social declarations, or Facebook, or even the internet, or any of the things we're doing in Nevada. No, we are targeting best practices, collaborating with other national and world leaders. We are continually raising our expectations, and we are, frankly, working our tails off. Today, the Nevada Donor Network finds itself being recognized as a world leader in organ donation. We don't say that to be boastful. No, we say it to invoke dialogue, to challenge the status quo. We say it to set the bar higher and higher, to share what we know with others and vice versa. We say it to get others to think about what they can do so that they can look at things differently. We want everyone in the organ donation space to look at this crisis differently. Why, you ask? Because lives depend on it. And I know, because mine did. Thank you. My name is Dr. Amy Waterman. And I'm a crier for this field. I love this field. So if I cry through this whole thing, we're just going to have to include it, OK? <laughs> I'm a health psychologist and the director of the Transplant Research and Education Center at UCLA. Transplant is the best of humanity and the best of health care. Every day, I witness the gratitude that kidney patients feel when they realize that someone has offered to donate an organ to them so that they can live a longer and better quality of life. I see the profound kindness and courage of living donors who are willing to undergo surgery to help someone else. I see the skill of surgeons who can remove a kidney from one person or any organ and put it into somebody else and get it working. I watch the expertise of a multidisciplinary team ensuring that these transplants work for decades. It is an honor to work in this field. In the U.S. right now, there are 660,000 patients who have kidney failure. I want to take you to a hard day in their lives, <laughs> a day when the patients hear for the first time that their kidneys are failing. What are they going to do? That sleepless night when they're alone with their thoughts, worrying what they should do next. Other people are right there with them, the patient's wife, his daughter, their friends. How could they help? Could they maybe be living donors? During these hard days and nights, there is an incredible opportunity to learn, to get strategic, to make the best, most informed choices about how to live a long time, to decide whether to pursue getting on the transplant waiting list or living donation, for loved ones to learn with the patient and to see if they would step forward to offer a, donate, a kidney too. 
research shows that patients and their family members and friends who receive better transplant education and living donor education as early as possible are more likely to become waitlisted and receive living donor kidney transplants, to receive transplants, period, because they start out smarter. They, take, they can take advantage of all of the new innovations that we're going to be talking about today, and I want everyone to have access to them. Many people are going to talk about the organ donor shortage today. I want to talk about the shortage of consistent education outside of transplant centers and consistent education about living donation for the family members and friends as well. We have to meet this shortage too because the clock starts ticking when someone's organs fail, when someone's kidneys fail. When their kidneys stop working, many patients have to start dialysis. While life-saving, only 40% of, of patients on dialysis will be alive after five years, compared to 75% if they can get a kidney from someone who has died, or 87% if they receive a living donor kidney. We have to get people and their families learning quickly. But there's a lot to learn about deceased and living donation. Many patients on dialysis never take the time to come to a transplant center to learn more from the experts. African-American and Hispanic patients are less likely to come forward. Patients who don't speak English are less likely. Patients who don't have a car to drive to the transplant center. These patients are less likely to receive education at all, to be referred for, or to receive transplants. This is not okay. Family members and friends who might want to help or be living donors, they don't always live in the same city as the patient. They can't take off work to go to a medical appointment. And patients are private about their health condition. They don't want to talk about this always. So we have a quiet conversation that needs to get loud. Finally, much of the information available on the internet has not been formally vetted by the transplant community. It can be confusing, overwhelming, and sometimes wrong. Speaking on behalf of the Blue Ribbon Advisory Panel in which I represent, we believe that everybody should be able to make an informed decision about transplant and living donation, and that you shouldn't have to come to a transplant center to learn. Therefore, leaders in the design of transplant education from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Duke University School of Medicine, Emory University, Johns Hopkins University, Mount Sinai Hospital, Northwestern University, Temple University, and the University of California, Los Angeles have created a Blue Ribbon Advisory Panel committed to establishing a national online clearinghouse of educational resources about transplant and living donation for patients, living donors, and the interested public. The goal of this panel is to ensure informed transplant and living donation decision making and equity in access to quality information to combat barriers that research suggests limits access to transplants. Resources will be made publicly available by the end of summer of 2017. We may not yet have enough kidneys to go around, organs to go around, but we can make sure that there's enough education to go around for all Americans. Thank you. I'm Al Roth, an economist at Stanford. Most people waiting for transplants are waiting for kidneys. And kidneys are special because healthy people have two and can remain healthy with one. And so each year in the US, we transplant over 5,000 living donor kidneys, along with over 11,000 deceased donor kidneys. Kidney transplantation is also special. It's both the best treatment for kidney failure, giving recipients many more years of life, and also the cheapest treatment. The American healthcare system saves over a quarter of a million dollars in five years after a transplant because dialysis is much more expensive than transplantation and post-transplant care. I'm going to tell you now a little bit about some, how some living donor kidney transplants are organized as background for one of the quite concrete announcements that we have today. Sometimes a person is healthy enough to donate a kidney but can't give to the patient he loves because kidneys have to be biologically compatible. This opens up the possibility of kidney exchange, and exchange is where economists come in. Kidney exchange is a kind of matching market in which patient donor pairs can donate compatible kidneys to one another so that each patient gets a compatible kidney. For example, if you and I are healthy enough to donate a kidney but can't donate to the patient we love, maybe my kidney is compatible with your patient and yours with mine. And so a simple exchange between two patient donor pairs can make two additional transplants possible. 
In the last 10 or 15 years, kidney exchange has become a standard part of American medicine, resulting in thousands of additional transplants. Sometimes a non-directed donor comes forward, an altruistic donor who wishes to donate a kidney and doesn't have a particular patient in mind. These donors can spark chains of transplants that help patient donor pairs in the kidney exchange pool and patients on the deceased donor waiting list who don't have a living donor. Some of these chains can produce many transplants ever since we've learned to organize them as non-simultaneous chains in which the non-directed donor initiates a chain by giving to a patient donor pair whose donor then gives to another pair and so on, most often ending with a donation to someone on the waiting list who doesn't have a living donor. These chains can be long because they don't have to be conducted simultaneously since every pair receives a kidney before giving one so they don't risk giving a kidney and not getting one. Mike Reese who's here today, organized the first non-simultaneous chain, which had 20 people, 10 donors and 10 transplant recipients, in the picture that was eventually published in People magazine. The average non-directed chain produces five transplants. That is, if someone offers to donate a kidney to start a chain, someone offering to help a stranger with this amazing gift of a kidney in a life free from dialysis, then on average, that one donor's gift will start a chain which produces five transplants. With that in mind, earlier, than this, earlier this year, several eminent surgeons and I published an article in the American Journal of Transplantation noting that deceased donor kidneys are almost all non-directed. So we proposed that we should occasionally start non-directed donor chains with deceased donor kidneys, which are non-directed non -directed donor kidneys that today are used to produce just a single transplant. Carefully done, this could substantially increase the number of transplants for all patients both those waiting without a living donor and those waiting for an exchange. Today, surgeons at Walter Reed, who are here today, have announced that they are going to pilot this idea through the military share program, which gives them the flexibility to allocate certain deceased donor kidneys to the benefit of veterans and service members. This new initiative at Walter Reed may soon show us how to move forward on a larger scale in using some deceased donor organs to start chains of multiple transplants. To summarize, kidney chains can play an important role in increasing transplants. Since the first long non-directed donor chain was organized by Dr. Reese in 2007, thousands of kidney exchange transplants have been accomplished, more than half through non-directed donor chains. These save both lives and money by increasing the number of transplants. So we should take good care of our non-directed living donors, and there is a growing consensus that we should at least figure out ways to reimburse all living donors for their financial costs, including lost wages. And we should, in gratitude to our deceased donors, make the best possible use of their non-directed donation. I'd like to personally thank Walter Reed for their initiative in pioneering the use of deceased donor kidneys to start kidney exchange chains that will increase donation and benefit both those waiting for deceased donors and those waiting for exchange. Starting kidney transplant chains with deceased donor kidneys has the potential to be a very significant innovation. Thank you.